Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Observe how carefully the foremost Western intellectuals speak when they're talking about any other subject. That truth has to be deeper than accidents of culture and just mere historical contingencies. The fact that somebody was born in, in Mesopotamia and not in China and got a different language game. They think hard and deep, picking their words carefully. Every summation is considered, mulled over, then postulated in measured and calibrated language. There is a catastrophe of, of arbitrary moral injunction and that there's a catastrophe of moral relativism and that that, that has to be dealt with and that there are genuine differences between the proper way of behaving morally and, and, and the improper way of behaving morally. But then something happens to these sharply dressed, silk-tongued, subtle thinkers when it comes to the topic of Islam. They transform into these unhinged, superficial hacks and thugs. Their language becomes sloppy and prejudice consumes them. He was not a... Um, a meditator, who, an ascetic, who sat cross-legged under a Bodhi tree. Uh, he was a, a warlord who did many of the things that, uh, that you see um, uh, members of ISIS doing. Muhammad was a warlord. And I, I don't know what to do about that fact. What do you think could be the reason Jordan Peterson uses a loaded word like warlord in this context, is it sloppiness? Okay, because I'm very, very, very careful with my words. Doubtful. Let me have a go. Because number one, he has no affinity for Islam. Islam is just not a part of Jordan Peterson's tradition and world view. Why should Jordan Peterson care about Islam? Two. He risks no reputational damage and has everything to gain. In today's world, attacking Islam is incentivized in many ways. Anyhow, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. When we hear the word warlord from Jordan Peterson, what images is it supposed to conjure up in our minds? How about aggression, ruthlessness, tyrant, Dictator, strongman, oppressor, ferocious. The Oxford Dictionary says a military commander, especially an aggressive regional commander with individual autonomy. If we were to distill a definition from all this, it'd be something like a tyrannical regional commander whom oppresses his people for personal gain and survival. Let me, inshallah, now prove to the doubters and the haters like Jordan Peterson that our Prophet Muhammad wasallam was definitely not a warlord. Wherever you get a warlord, you see the aspiration for power and influence. The two are inseparable. A modern archetypical example is Liberia's former president, Charles Taylor who was a diamond embezzling warlord who aided and abetted African rebels who committed heinous atrocities against millions of African people. Was our Prophet Salam's goal power? If it was, then why did he begin a world renouncing movement that led his followers headlong into poverty, starvation and into the jaws of death? For 13 years, his followers were shunned, boycotted by Meccan society, persecuted, killed, and then chased out of their own homes and city of birth, Makkah, without their possessions. They became refugees in Abyssinia and then Yathrib. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was beaten unconscious in the streets while slaves like Bilal bin Rabah radiallahu anhu and Shuhayb bin Sinan radiallahu anhu were shackled and left to scorch in the midday desert sun. The first martyr was Sumayya bin Khayyat radiallahu anha who was murdered with a spear thrust through her 
pelvis and her son Amr bin Yasir anha, anhu, sorry, was tortured with fire like so many others. Um, Khabab bin Al-Arat was forced to lie on burning coals and smell his own flesh cooking. As for the Prophet وسلم, himself, the abuse he suffered from the idolaters of Quraysh was a brutal. Uqba bin Abi Mu'ayt strangled him from behind when he prayed in public. Abu Jahl ordered camel intestines to be dumped over him while he prostrated. Utayba bin Abi Lahab spat at him and others beat him unconscious so much for wanting power. Another incident that tells us more directly that Muhammad وسلم, wasn't interested in power is when the Quraysh chiefs famously sent Uthba ibn Rabi'ah to literally offer, if you want wealth, we will collect money from our wealth so that you may be the wealthiest person of us. If you want honor, we will make you our leader and we will not decide any matter without you. If you want sovereignty, we will make you our king. But the Prophet wasn't interested in worldly power. And that's why he told them to stick it. Wherever you get a warlord, like the law of gravity, you see a tyrant motivated by greed and personal gain. He will enrich his family with land and wealth and live in palaces, indulge in luxury, while the commoners under him starve. They don't have any higher goals, no ideals or a noble purpose whatsoever. One good modern example is Jean Beidel Bokassa, also known as the Butcher of Bangui who was the leader of the Central African Republic and then Empire from 1966 to 1979. Bokassa named himself President for Life and then Emperor in 1976, declaring a monarchy. His coronation ceremony, check this out, cost an estimated $20 million. Just one ceremony, one third of the country's budget for the year. Can you believe this? And afterwards, Bokassa became known for his lavish spending. Now, this is a bona fide warlord. Let's now look at the lavish lifestyle of the Prophet ﷺ. Firstly, what did our Prophet ﷺ do with his so-called gains as a warlord? When some people spoke about the division of booty that was gained from battle, the Prophet ﷺ said this, quote, I have nothing of this booty except the hummus, which is one-fifth that was allocated to him, and the hummus is returned to you. In other words, the Prophet ﷺ gave it back. The Prophet ﷺ did not even take for himself the one-fifth that was his due share of the booty. According to Abu Huraira, the Messenger of Allah would tie a stone to his stomach because of hunger. Amr ibn al-Harith said, the Prophet ﷺ, quote, left nothing behind except his weapon, his white mule, and some land that he left behind as a charity. Show me a warlord, and I will show you a barbarian who cruelly dispatches his opponents and isn't fussed about a high death count. One contemporary example of a warlord doing this is Robert Mugabe, who was elected president of his country in 1980. His Zimbabwean 5th Brigade crushed an uprising in Western Zimbabwe in the mid-1980s, killing, check this out, 20,000 civilians. Ya yeah, subhanAllah. The 5th Brigade was known for burning people alive and for forcing people to dig their own graves in public executions. In comparison, Jordan Peterson's favorite warlord, Muhammad Wasallam, gave various injunctions to his forces and made them adopt certain practices in their conduct of war. The most important of these were summarized by Muhammad's companion and first caliph, Abu Bakr anhu, in the form of 10 rules for the Muslim army. Do not commit treachery or deviate from the right path. You must not mutilate dead bodies, neither kill a child, nor a woman, nor an aged man. Bring no harm to the trees, nor burn them with fire, especially those which are fruitful. Slay not any of the enemy's flock, save for your food. You are likely to pass by people who have devoted their lives to monastic services. Leave them alone. Now these rules will not be matched in the world until 1400 years later on the 22nd of August 1864 when a conference adopted the first Geneva Convention 
during the 23 years in which the Islamic revolution was completed under the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 80 military expeditions took place. Fewer than 20 expeditions actually, listen to this, involved any fighting. Fewer than 20 involved any fighting. 259 Muslims were killed in those 23 years and 759 non-Muslims died in these battles. Oppressive regime. Tell me, which tyrant busy oppressing his people tells them that the rich and powerful should not oppress the weak, the powerful should take care of the poor, pay charity, zakat, look after the neighbours, wafers, the miskeen, that oppression, zulm is evil, and taking interest and ripping people off is haram. Would these teachings of justice and equity help a tyrant, do you think, or undermine his cruel regime? And that is precisely the kind of noble ethics the Prophet Muhammad wasallam taught his followers. Quote, so by mercy from Allah, O Muhammad, you were lenient with them, and if you had been rude in speech and harsh in heart, they would have disbanded from about you. Another hallmark of a tyrannical warlord is that they're always paranoid. Because of the many that they have killed to get to the top, they are forever paranoid. And as soon as they get to the top, they get rid of all the rivals or anyone whom is deemed a threat. A famous modern example is the butcher of Uganda, Idi Amin, whom we've mentioned before. He killed many in his own army, as he was constantly paranoid about being overthrown. In the Night of the Long Knives, Hitler had many leaders of the SA, the best known being um, Ruhm himself, the SA's chief of staff purged. Like the second law of thermodynamics, rivals get eliminated. The closest rivals to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu would have been Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. May Allah be pleased with them all. His four successors. Tell me, how many purges did our Prophet carry out? Jordan? Forget purges of his companions. Our Prophet would constantly seek his companions' opinions in line with the divine command in the Quran. For example, the location of the battlefield of Badr was decided after Al-Habbab ibn Al-Mundir proposed it. The Prophet's counselling with his companions was so common that Abu Huraira is reported to have said, quote, I never saw anyone consult his companions more often than the Messenger of Allah. Unlike your typical paranoid warlord, the Prophet also advised and taught beware of suspicion, for suspicion is most false of tales. Do not seek out faults, do not spy on each other, do not contend with each other, do not envy each other, do not hate each other, and do not turn away from each other. Rather be servants of Allah, as brothers. Who does that? Which tyrant tells his henchmen to not be suspicious and spy on his fellow citizens? No tyranny with a warlord at its head is complete without a reign of terror once victory is at hand. Whether it's the Red Terror of Chairman Mao, Stalin's Great Purge, or the famous French La Terreur, which was a period of the French Revolution when following the creation of the First Republic, a series of massacres and numerous public executions took place in response to revolutionary fervour. So imagine this man, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, marching at the head of a full 10,000 strong force to oust the Quraysh from the sacred precincts. He's at the peak of his power. He knows that these same Qurayshi had persecuted him in every way imaginable for 13 years in Makkah. They had executed his companions, expelled him from his homeland, injured him at Uhud, mobilized to annihilate his nation at Al-Azab, and who had signed a treaty, Al-Hudaybiyah, that they quickly broke. He and his Muslims have faced 20 years of relentless hostilities from the Meccans. The Muslims ride into Mecca, led by the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who kept his head lowered out of humility for Allah to the point, it is said, that his beard almost touched his saddle. It reached him, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The some were saying, you know, in the crowd, quote, O oh, Abu Sufyan, today is the day of your people's slaughter. After securing the city, Everyone gathered before the Prophet ﷺ at the Qa'bah and he asked them tenderly, O gathering of Quraysh, 
What do you think I will do to you? They said, Only good, noble brother. Ending the moment of suspense, he, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, declared, quote, I will only say to you what Yusuf said to his brothers. No blame will there be upon you today. Go, for you are unbound. The Prophet sallallahu rose above it all, immortalizing himself with this grace in one of the most remarkable events in human history. There would be no reign of terror or a grand purge of his former oppressors. You have seen the evidence, and it should be obvious to the impartial observer that in no way does an honest look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad show us any evidence that Muhammad was a warlord.